Hello everyone! Welcome to the first ever episode of The Stew. This is a new video series that I'm starting where I talk about a lot of the different pieces of media that meant a lot to me in this past month. We are what we eat. And that's a fundamental philosophy that I believe when it comes to media because I believe that we are made up of the media we consume. And I want to take this time to really talk about the things that meant a lot to me. Because making video essays on this channel takes a long time. And oftentimes I will consume a lot of media and I won't get a chance to talk about it normally. This will not replace any of my video essays. Video essays will still be coming, but I just wanted to make a more regular appearance on my channel and just talk to you all face to face. And you can all get to know me and I really want to get to know you all. Oftentimes, I will try to get other people involved in these videos as well, including doing interviews, polls, anything else. So if you want to be a part of these videos and share your opinion, please go ahead and join my Patreon and Discord communities. Sometimes I might not actually talk about things that premiered in the month that I'm talking about. For example, in this video, I'm going to be talking about Fallout and Another Crab's Treasure, two things that premiered in April. The reason why I'm talking about things a little bit late is I take some time to consume media, and I think we all do. So I want to give some of that buffer time so that we're able to have a discussion. You can get to know me, and I can get to know you, and we can talk about what these pieces of media really meant to us. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and talk about all the different movies, games, TV shows, everything else I've consumed in the past month that have shaped me and have been added to my metaphorical stew. So first up on the list, I want to talk about one of the biggest July releases for me, which is Deadpool and Wolverine. In terms of the question what Deadpool and Wolverine meant to me, I would honestly have to say it meant a lot. First off, it was a fantastic movie. I really appreciated the movie and I really loved the humor and the lightheartedness that always Deadpool movies have, but I really appreciated its deeper meaning. For me, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been really hit or miss lately. You cannot match the anticipation and the excitement that we all had during Endgame, especially now that stories are so much more convoluted and there are so many more characters that feel very minor and there's so many different plot points that essentially don't feel like they matter. And I think that's the biggest point that Deadpool and Wolverine made and it really meant a lot to me. Throughout the movie, again, small spoilers, the character Wade Wilson Deadpool feels like he doesn't really matter. And though he has a small community that really makes him feel like he matters, I feel it's a really good commentary on how the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been constructed so far. There are so many stories, so many random characters, so many things to really get involved with this universe that honestly, I'm not excited for most of them. But I can truly recognize that the things that matter to people will vary from person to person. Just like Deadpool and Wolverine, a movie that honestly I wasn't really excited for because the Marvel Cinematic Universe isn't something that I'm excited for these days. But watching the movie really meant a lot to me because it was a good movie and I really had a good time watching it. So I can't discount any of the Marvel projects that they're coming out with or that they've done in the past to be unimportant. They matter to all types of different people, even the ones that we consider bad. Any piece of art can always be someone's favorite. And I think that's what Deadpool and Wolverine taught me. With the messaging of things that matter and also showing a bunch of cameos, which I will not spoil, but it was really heartwarming to see so many cameos of characters that you might have forgotten, but they do matter. A little bit more spoilers about the plot, but the fact that they go to the place where everyone gets forgotten because of their timelines and see all of those characters, all of those people who essentially don't end up mattering to any sort of story anymore, it's really heartwarming to see those characters again. Those characters being brought to life on the big screen again. And I really feel that Deadpool and Wolverine was a movie that was made with a lot of love. And you could see that it really loved its characters. And it really loved the audience. It wanted to show us really cool things and things that was just a blast to see in theaters. I really appreciated that the movie did take a lot of jabs on things that I was feeling, like that the MCU was in a bad shape these days, or that the multiverse stuff was so overplayed now. I really appreciated that they made jokes about it. And ultimately, 
I know that Deadpool and Wolverine is not the movie that gets me back into the MCU. I am a little bit more optimistic. I will say with the Fantastic Four movie coming out and who knows what other projects I will eventually like after watching it, I am a little bit more optimistic because I don't think any of these movies are particularly bad. They all matter to someone, but there's no one specific movie that will save the entire franchise. Just based on the last line of Deadpool and Wolverine, sometimes the people we save, save us. And watching Disney sort of take a chance on making something like Deadpool and Wolverine really showed that the MCU can be saved, but not just by Deadpool, not just by Deadpool and Wolverine, but by really caring about characters and really making stories matter. We don't want to see so many intricate storylines that ultimately don't mean anything. We also don't want to see a bunch of endings where it's like, you will see this character again in 10 years. It's like, wow, give me some tight storytelling and give me some moments where I can really relate to characters and I can have a fun time with these movies because a lot of these movies are that. There are a bunch of fun moments stitched together into a movie and Deadpool and Wolverine is the best representation of that. I think overall, it really means a lot when you can see a lot of care went into making the film. And that's what they have to do. They have to care about the specific film they're making and not a 10 year plan that, God, 10 years? Avengers 4 or Avengers 5 and 6 and 7? Like, who knows what I'll be doing by then? And who knows if I'll even care? But just make me care in the moment with these movies and make sure that everything matters because they always do. The next thing I want to talk to you all about is a series that is near and dear to my heart, but I'm going to be joined by my cousin, Jacob, and we're going to have a conversation on what Fallout has meant to us. A long time fan of the show, the podcast, <laughs> love consuming media. I've seen many, many things in this life. A lot of them horrors, but most of them, mm -hmm. you know, the goodness of humanity. And I don't think there's anything better to talk about. Wow. That was deep. That was like, <laughs> all right. First, before we talk about the show, uh, what is your history with Fallout? How much Fallout have you played, if you could quantify it? Oh, my goodness. I, 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 my first experience with Fallout was like in high school, like 2014, playing Fallout 3. And really? Just loving it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played, I was like it was taken aback by like the storytelling and just how interesting characters could be. Because I don't know if you remember this. But there's a certain cover of the Game Informer magazine that we spoke about. And I was like, just this random game I've never heard about called The Elder Scrolls V. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and you were like, you're like, what are you talking about? That's it's Skyrim, blah, blah, blah. And then I started looking at the company and I saw Bethesda and oh. Obsidian and all that. And then that's kind of what actually did get me into Fallout. And then after that, I was like hooked. I just learned some Jacob lore. I got you into Fallout. Pretty much, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then yeah, and then I got one and two, and I was like, wow, I need to watch YouTube videos on what happens in these because I'm absolutely not playing these games. <laughs> they are so yeah. not modern. They do they don't age super well, but you know, the story in them is actually, if, arguably, I, I would say better than some of the newer games. But the games have a lot of charm to them, no matter what. And I think the show very much accurately ca uh, captures that, those feelings. But that's crazy because, you know, it just, it just reminds me like our small little interactions can lead to so much more. And the fact that I told you about Skyrim and <laughs> that got you into looking into Bethesda and going into playing Fallout, that's crazy because my history with Fallout, I played Fallout 3 and I played this when I got the game from GameStop and I didn't know that fast travel was a thing. Right. <laughs> so I actually walked, just kept walking. And there was a certain point where I entered a building and the enemies had nukes. And I was like level two and they were like level 50 or whatever. And uh, instantly yeah. one shot, instantly one shot. <laughs> and I was like, oh crap, let me get out of here. Try to open the door. It says you can't leave when there's enemies. I'm like, what do I do? And then all of a sudden, my save was in the building, and that was the only save I had. And I was like, oh, I played, I walked like for like four hours. This is it? I'm not going to 
and I returned the game. I'm not gonna do it again. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was Fallout Three, and then with, <laughs> with Fallout New Vegas, I played like thirty hours of New Vegas, which I didn't see everything of the game. I, I saw a good chunk. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good, a good amount. Yeah, and I don't really remember it that much because I played it back in 2013, and it's been over 10 years. And then both Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 are games like I touched, and I was like, you know, it would be nice to play these, but nothing's yeah. really drawing me in. But the Fallout show literally made me want to play Fallout more than <laughs> any other thing in the Fallout series. It's like the way that they presented the lore, the way that they presented, you know, like the environment and just like the wackiness uh, and just all that stuff was like there's actual depth and a lot of fun to be had with these games and i'm like why does it it just it just makes me want to play fallout again something i want to bring up i feel like it says a lot about a game that you can walk for four hours without fast travel and you don't give up earlier most of that time nothing's going on but you're just listening to the radio you got Mr. New Vegas in your head or whatever, or the, the, the Fallout Enclave radio, and the, the environment being so fantastic to look at still, and it's so like stimulating that you don't actually need to, you don't need any like third party thing to like keep going. You could totally play that game without fast travel, and you would still be entertained. Yeah, that's a great point. I really like that you mentioned the radio, because yeah. like I feel like that was a part of Fallout that made and cemented it to be as great. And I think when a game incorporates a lot of good music, mm -hmm. where it doesn't even have to be like, you know, the greatest song you ever heard, but like songs that like set the stage and really make you like, yeah. feel like either that old Tommy or like, yeah, like you're in this different setting because like in mm -hmm. Bioshock, you know, and you're playing in the game and it's in the sixties. So you hear like fifties yeah. and sixties music. And it's like, this is amazing. The ink spots where they play like, I don't want to set the world on fire and stuff like that. Yeah. When they play those in the show, I was like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> oh, my deep memories are being like activated. I'm like, oh, this song, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they also ended season one on such a high note. Like we were watching season one and Sam watched the last episode with me and she was like, this episode saved the entire show. It was really? it was okay, and then the lore, just about like capitalism and how deep they yeah. go with the story. Oh, it put it over the top. Like in her eyes, it redeemed it a little bit more because you know it's it felt very video gamey at times. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah. And then the the actual story and the backstory about like capitalism and stuff like that. And also, you're watching it on Amazon Prime, so there's like this disconnect. <laughs> but it's like, oh, like they started the bombs, and it's like, oh my god, it's like all this stuff. And then you see like New Vegas at the end, and I'm I'm just like, yeah. If they play Johnny Guitar in season two, I'm gonna be Dude, like, ooh. I, I stood up and screamed when I saw the Vegas skyline. <laughs> I was like, yes, they do it. I was I was so thinking that they were gonna retcon that game no, in the, the TV show. Yeah. But then he he walks over the dune, he crushes a he passes a death claw skull, and I said. I was like, no way. <laughs> this is incredible. I'm so excited for, for part two. And I really like yeah. how they incorporated the vaults. I think the vaults and those scenes were like some of my favorite parts of the show. Just the representation of them, like in the societies and like how they're little like microcosms of like American civilization and yeah. just like hyper fixating on these glaring issues that they have made their entire personality. Yeah. When it's like that. It's clearly not a normal thing yet. They've been in there for like 200 years. There's many generations of people. Now it's just okay, which is, again, another commentary, just how things just become okay when nobody says it's wrong, you know? Yeah, yeah that's a great point. Like, there's so much <laughs> you can do with, like, the isolationist ideas of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, vault. It's like, wow. I, and I really liked how in the show they were like, oh, just, you know, do your own experiments with people, which is awful. <laughs> but it's like, oh, well, now you like you get to dive in like, oh, number vault number four was full of scientists. You know, 31, yeah. 32, 33. They're like a community they were the, together. They're, they're connected by tunnels. Yeah. Vaults, which was very interesting. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, like, that's so interesting. That's like that's such a cool concept. And I think some of my favorite scenes were in the vaults, you know, like yeah. I loved that. 
they perpetuated like mystery and stuff in the vault too. Mm-hmm. So it kept you like, oh, like what is the dark secret with these vaults? It was just like, like playing the games, how you would come across these in like the in the wasteland, and you'd be like, what the hell happened here? Yeah. And you look through the terminals and stuff, and you'd be like, oh wow, they were working on a virus. They're working on a plant thing to make food grow faster, but it be, it infected everybody. And they turn into plant people, and then that's why I had to just shoot a bunch of plant people to get to this computer. Yeah, yeah, and and that's one thing like I really appreciate about the show is like the way that the lore was dispensed from the show is obviously in a, mm. in a TV show fashion, but like in a, in the video game, the lore is just harder to pick up on because it's so expansive. Like you have to pick up these notes and go through these terminals and stuff, and you might miss some things. And I think that's where. Yeah, that's true with the lore of fallout it's like oh seeing it all like in the show made me like now i want to go learn more about the lore now i want (laughs) to go play those games again now i want to go kill those plant people over and over again i guess my biggest gripe with the show is that it had it didn't have anything to go off of fine it had all the lore and stuff but it didn't have like a specific video game to follow which is why i felt at times that it was it was a bit emptier than i would have liked it to be like there was the, the 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 NCR the, the the factions I guess is my biggest thing is that the, the brotherhood was so fleshed out the NCR wasn't as fleshed out but they were still there and they were like they were like believe us they're 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 a big threat yeah. whatever they're they're a big they they have NCR places all over the place you know the brotherhood was clearly like the main faction they wanted to showcase but that's kind of all they really had you know they had the fiends but they had like only one scene with them like there's yeah. like they're all like they all had their own societies in the lore and stuff and there are whole on there are all these like intricate things and decision making processes that go on within them i didn't really feel like there was a lot of that in the Mm. show but again i do i do hope like the caesar's legion in new vegas is gonna be awesome and i and whoever they're gonna cast for caesar is gonna be very cool one of the gripes that i had was similar to what you felt is just like a lot of things didn't really matter like nothing was the show was very comical and yeah. obviously it was a comedy but a, yeah, lot of, yeah. a lot of things like as you said like when that small scene with the fiends it didn't really matter it didn't really yeah, like they were like they're cannibals yeah okay it didn't like, really like so what? <laughs> matter in the grand scheme of things and a lot of the like yeah. the, the serious moments where they could have been like oh crap like this was serious it's mm. like oh that actually wasn't that serious. Like when Lucy <laughs> lost her finger and then, you know, she was with the robot. It was like, oh, this is so crazy. And yeah. nothing happened because of that. It was just it was just a side quest. And it's like, OK, yeah. like it's not terrible, but it's also like you're not like you are building the world in a way that's just like, hey, look at this thing. Not like this yeah. is interconnected to all these other things. That's something that really lends itself well to a show. It's the items and the way that they interact with it. Because in the video game, you don't interact with it in the same way. Yeah, no, no, not at all. Yeah. And I think I think that's something that the show does very well. Just like, again, like with all the vials and the IVs and Radex and all the stuff. Right. That, and it's, it's know, great that they have so many little things to show, too. Like yeah. a Braxo cleaner and the Blamco yeah. mac and cheese, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it meant a lot to me because it's like, I I think video games are so amazing with their stories. And to see like a video game become a really good TV show, it not only just like follows a game, but like it expands upon stuff. Because like I watched The Last of Us as a TV show. The Last of Us, Us, yeah, it's it's a story. It's fantastic. It's great. It's a great story. But it's also like something that's story first, game second, in my opinion. Watching the fallout made me realize how enclosed The Last of Us is as mm. as media as a video game. I was like, wow, there's that's like the TV show. They they did everything. They did awesome things with it with the story, and they like you know used it to their own degree, manipulated the story however they wanted to to like work with it, and it still worked out fantastic. But it was like I was like that like is that's kind of it. Yeah. Like there's nothing more that you can do with this with a, with a thing like that. Not that you need to, but that's just like I was like, oh wow, I had no, I was like really like, sup- I didn't think of it when I was watching The Last of Us. I was like, oh, this is an awesome show, and then I watched Fallout, and I was like, damn, dude, they, I wish you could do more with The Last of Us like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 
it's a good point. Like, like when I watched Last of Us, it didn't make me want to play the game. But when I mm-hmm. when I watched Fallout, it was like, since it's also a separate story, yeah, it was yeah. like, oh, like this world again. Like I'm getting exposed to it. Oh, it would be so cool to play the game again and just dive right. in. So I think overall, Fallout show, they did a really fantastic job. I would agree. Like I enjoyed watching Fallout a lot more. And I think the lore of yeah. Fallout was like, ooh, like what is this? capitalism oh my god <laughs> no way we were the bad guys the whole time yeah. wow <laughs> so i think i think that part thanks was amazon very good. for showing me for yeah. telling me oh my that my overconsumption <laughs> is going to cause the end of society yeah thanks amazon thanks for telling me <laughs> the dangers of capitalism thanks alexa no problem <laughs> all right so that's pretty much it for fallout so what you just saw with jacob was a sort of casual conversation that I want to keep throughout these videos. Though you might notice the conversation was highly edited, the full conversation where we dive into a lot of aspects about Fallout will be available on my Patreon as an audio exclusive. Let me know in the future if you want more exclusive content via video or audio. Would you even prefer it on YouTube, where you can join a membership and watch this exclusive bonus content? Don't worry though, I will always include the most important parts in these episodes, so you're not missing the general meanings of things. But for those who really liked interviews and really wanted a little bit more from the content that we talk about, they will be all available for you on Patreon. All right, and the last thing I wanna talk to you all about today is a game called Another Crab's Treasure, which has meant a lot to me. This is a game made by the developers AgroCrab. This is their second title in their development history. And I gotta say, this game was one of the best games of the year for me. Their first game, Going Under, which was about startups and sort of a roguelike game where you go through an internship like this, really cemented the idea of the dangers of capitalism. When starting the game, it really talks about resilience and how the earth is resilient. And I loved that. It's so common for all these souls like to be really difficult, but to start by just saying, you need to have resilience like the earth, just sort of sets that precedent like, oh, this is gonna be a challenge. But when playing, I will definitely say the combat mechanics were a bit janky. I did not actually enjoy the combat until about like 30 or 40% in the game when I got the upgrades where I would throw the fishing hook and like charge at them or throw the fishing hook and pull them towards me or even getting like the hammer for the shell and other things like that. I truly believe that this game wasn't that great to play unless you had the upgrades. And as soon as you have the upgrades, the combat mechanics worked so well. But talking about the difficulty of Souls-like games like Another Crab's Treasure, the assist mode in the game is revolutionary. I look at Elden Ring and I understand why they made it as difficult as they did. They tailor the experience to a very specific set of people and a very specific set of circumstances. Am I upset that Elden Ring can be too hard for people? No, I'm not upset. I just think it is more about accessibility for me. I'm really sad that a lot of people won't be able to experience the masterpiece of Elden Ring because of the difficulty. And I believe that games like Another Crab's Treasure or even recently I played Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which fantastic game. Those games are so good and they are so accessible for people who are having trouble with difficulty. That being said, I turned on the accessibility mode in Another Crab's Treasure. I was not about to go die to a bunch of crabs over and over and over again. I set everything on low and it really helped initially. I thought by the end of the game, again with those combat mechanics, it became a little too easy. I wish you could actually have made the assist mode into a challenge mode as well. So I can be like lower enemy health, yes. Or raise enemy health, yes, something like that. I think it would have benefited from both. I think there's a huge point where things become too easy for the game. But overall, like astounding game. I loved the environments. I thought the world building and everything else about it was superb. I love the creative direction. The fact that the currency is microplastics, the fact that you go through new Carcinia and it's a bunch of trash really horrifying but at the same time like so good at world building i appreciated the characters too at a certain point they actually finally clicked 
I think the point at which it clicked was probably like 65% of the way when we go to the pinball machine. I think that level, the cutscenes before it really cemented the game to be like, we're having a real story now. I loved the fact that they started implementing a lot more meaningful dialogue, which I will say, I think Another Crab's Treasure has writing that's really on the notes. Like, it's not subtle at all. They just hammer it. Like, you enter this swampy wasteland and they're like, oh, why is it so swampy? I thought this guy was a good businessman. And they're like, this is what good business looks like. And I'm like, so you're not subtle at all with portraying capitalism to be a bad thing. But I really appreciated that they went so hard on the messaging before it. They initially started with the Earth is resilient, but by the end of it, they talk about that the Earth is resilient only to a certain degree. And that shifted my perspective a lot. And I really appreciate that they mentioned complacency because the main character that you play of, Krill, is going through a lot of tumultuous times in their life. And I think that Krill really just wanted to go back to the status quo and I don't think I've seen a protagonist that was really complacent and just done with the world after learning so much about the world. Because I feel like at that point, by the end of the game, when Krill is still like, I just want to go home. That's the sort of mentality that Krill had the entire game. At times it was annoying. It was like, oh my God, like, can't you see people are suffering? Or can't you see like you're, you're fighting demons or something like that? But I really appreciate it because the character was consistent and it turns out like, oh, well, that's a problem. Because if you dive into your complacency, if you sit in a place where you just feel comfortable, even though the world is burning around you, it's not going to help the fire go out if you're just sitting and doing nothing. And honestly, that's one of the reasons why I started this series. I wanted to talk about the things that really meant a lot to me in a place that felt more casual, more face-to-face. -face. So that way, like, I can really stop my complacency and talk about things that really matter. I think for a long time, I never really thought my voice was worth listening to. And with the video essays and now playing Another Crab's Treasure, I truly feel that I want to make a difference and I want to do it in a way that I can. So that's again, one of the reasons why I'm starting the show. I want to make a difference where we all talk about things that matter to us. We all talk about things that are serious. Like these topics aren't just jokes. The amount of trash and plastics in the ocean isn't a joke. Oil spills and everything else like that. These are serious things. There are repercussions on all the marine life. And that's just for the sea. There's so much stuff that's going on land, politics, everything else like that. Like the world is not built for people to just not do anything. We have to do something. And I want to do something now by starting this series and just engaging you all and bringing in other people and talking about things that really matter. So yeah, you could say Another Crab's Treasure really changed my life. So kudos to the entire Agro Crab team. This game was amazing, actually. And again, like I loved that it wasn't subtle. I feel like a lot of people that play video games, oftentimes, like for example, with Elden Ring, the lore is too subtle in Elden Ring. I can't, I, I would not be able to understand what the hell is going on without a video explaining it. But Another Crab's Treasure, I don't need anyone else to explain it. They explain it for me. I feel like it's so refreshing to just see a game say like, hey, stop being complacent. Like the world is burning. And I think that really affected me. A lot of games are like, let's show you how the world is burning and let's see how you feel about it. But this game was like, hey, let's show you the world's burning and we'll tell you that you freaking need to do something about it. So anyway, I can talk about the crap's treasure a lot. It meant a lot to me. And I think as a soul's like, it was a really fun game. It was it was really jank at times. Don't get me wrong. So glad they had the assist mode because without the assist mode, those jank moments would be much harder to deal with. But because they had assist mode, they made everything so much more worth it. A little side note, right before we finish this video, I'm going to talk about the movie Love Lies Bleeding. Now, Love Lies Bleeding is a decent movie. It's not particularly for me, but I want to just insert a small tidbit about what that movie meant to me. I really like the messaging for the movie of the bodybuilding competition. 
So throughout the movie, Jackie really wants to partake in this bodybuilding competition. And she's working out constantly. You see her growing. And with the addition of steroids and other things that happen, you see Jackie getting bigger. But I really appreciated the end of the movie, which, slight spoilers, I really appreciated that she was the biggest that she's ever been because she's trying to save someone she loves. And I think that makes us larger as people already. But the thing that makes you the biggest person you can possibly be is protecting and caring for the ones you love. And I really like that message. So although I don't think the movie was for me exactly, I believe the romance was too rushed. I believe a lot of story points felt kind of lackluster. I do appreciate the messaging. And there you have it. Thank you all so much for watching the very first episode of The Stew. If you have any thoughts about the format of the show, or if you want to talk about any specific part about it, how can I make it better? Please let me know. I definitely want to make this monthly show a, as best as it can be. I want to let you all know like that you're going to get quality, you're going to get thoughts, you're going to get reviews. But beyond just reviews and thoughts, you're really going to get meaning. And I think we can find meaning in everything that we do, especially the things that we watch. With that, Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you did like this video. And if you ever want to get involved with this show, please go ahead and check out the Discord and the Patreon to see how you can get involved. Thank you all so much for watching and have a wonderful rest of your day. I will see you all next month.